Okay, so hello, welcome to Convict Inc. I'm your host, Robert Rosso, and today I'm going to talk about my first day in the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, also known as USP Leavenworth. But before I do, um, I'd like to remind you to please go to my website, convictinc.net. Check it out. We provide um, prison consulting, legal assistance, pen pal counseling, and yes, that's a thing, pen pal counseling. In fact, been getting more um, emails about that than anything else. And um, and also uh, immigration. So uh, I know a little bit about immigration law. In fact, quite a bit. Got my wife here doing it myself. And um, I can practice anybody can actually do immigration law without a license. It's administrative. It's not civil. It's not criminal. It's administrative. But um, um, I'm not trying to do immigration uh, work. I, I will do immigration uh, assisting anybody who's incarcerated, who has a spouse or a loved one or whatever that they're trying to get into the country. I will. I know all about how to navigate that and uh, will be glad to assist because, as you know, or as I've mentioned, I am married to now a legal resident who's from Spain. Anyway, first day in Leavenworth. Okay, so before I get there, let me say that um, Leavenworth was not the first prison I went to. In fact, I did 60 plus days in the LA County jail system. I did a year in the Arkansas Department of Corrections. That is the Pine Bluff unit, Cummins unit, and Calico Rock. Um, I did seven, eight months combined, maybe up to nine months in the Sebastian County Detention Center. And I did over a year in uh, Chino, that's Chino Central and Chino Level 1, 2 Yard. They call it Camp Snoopy, whatever, but that was Chino. So Chino was the last place I went to. I was out 11 months and a, a, a day or just right about there. Let's just call it 11 months. And boom, I got arrested for the conspiracy that led to my life sentence. So I was sentenced to life without the possibility of release on July the 17th, 1998. And I was able to stay in the Sebastian County Detention Center until September because I had a civil suit pending against the jail in which I represented myself. Um, the judge allowed me to stay in the jail because I had to pre prepare for my case. And uh, the day after, uh, we went to trial on my case. I um, I was transferred. Now, because most prisoners usually start, well, I'm, I'm not most, I'm sorry. A lot of federal prisoners go through the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City. Um, it's inside the Oklahoma City Airport. It's a big building. Uh, planes actually pull up to the building. Inmates are loaded on. Um, you've heard Con Air about Con Air, uh, that's, that's where um, the inmates are loaded onto Con Air planes that, they're, that are actually um, um, flown by the U.S. Marshal Service. Matter of fact, side note, I was on an episode of, 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 uh, of a history show called Transporting Dangerous Cargo. It was, uh, it was years ago, back in the early 2000s. They got clips of me and some of my guys leaving Leavenworth and being flown uh, to the East Coast. Transporting dangerous cargo. I got I to gotta actually look that up. I just thought about it. Okay, so anyway, uh, it was about a three-hour or so bus ride from the Sebastian County Detention Center, Fort Smith, Arkansas, to the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City. Um, once inside the Federal Transfer Center, uh, you know, it takes hours to get processed in, and I mean like nine, ten hours. You're exhausted. You got to go through the fingerprints. You got to go through the orientation process. Then you got to go through sitting and holding cells. And once you get up in the unit, back then it was really nice. Um, wow, I, I could do a whole episode on that, and I should have. So uh, at, at the time, the glass wasn't blacked out, and the, and the males and females can look across at each other, and uh, the girls would put on shows for guys. It's, that's all I'll say. I, I got to do an episode all about that. Anyway, so I was at the Oklahoma City Transfer Center for a, a week. Um I want to say right about a week. I've actually got notes. I can say the precise dates. And um, while I was at the Oklahoma Transfer Center, I, 
I really thought, you know, I'm a nonviolent drug offender. I've never had any violent history of violence or violence on record or been convicted of any violent crimes. I didn't understand about the United States Penitentiary, which is a ma maximum uh, or mediums, which are FCIs or LOs, uh, uh, LSCI, Low Security Correctional Institution, I think they're called, or camps. Um, but I didn't think I was going to a maximum security prison, even with life without parole, because of a non-drug drug offense. I thought I was going to end up going to uh, to Tennessee, um, Memphis. There's a prison, a federal prison in Memphis, and I really thought I was going to end up going there. Why, I don't know. But um, So I don't even know where I'm going when, when I'm called on the plane. A lot of guys had it in with counselors, or and the counselors would tell them, I didn't know. I didn't really know how to talk to staff at that point. Uh, I wasn't good at it. Um, my prior incarcerations, um, I, I, you know, when you when you don't build a rapport, you don't know your unit team or your counselor stuff like that. Well, I was just in Oklahoma City. I knew nobody, so I didn't know anybody to ask. I asked a couple people that they just looked at me like you know I had crap on my face. A uh, couple staff members, and they just they wouldn't tell me. So I'm on the airplane. And the airplane went from Oklahoma City to West Virginia, from West Virginia, uh, to Beckley, West Virginia, I believe it was, to North Carolina. Or maybe it was North Carolina first and Beckley. I I'm not sure. But anyway, so we, we did these stops, and then the plane turns around and it comes back. Leavenworth, Kansas is not too far from the Oklahoma City Transfer Center. So we did a loop. I'm on the plane for hours. So it wasn't until the, uh, they, I realized that they only had one more stop and people were saying that that one stop was Leavenworth. That's how I found out I was going to USP Leavenworth. And I was, you know, now I've been to maximum security prisons, um, you know, some, some, some couple tough joints. And, uh, but when you hear Leavenworth, they're, they're, it just does something to you. It, it does. So there's, there's fear. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, uh, I, I was just kind of in shock at first. Anyway, when we land at um, an airport right outside of Leavenworth, Kansas, I'm not really sure if it was in the Kansas City Airport or adjacent to the airport. Um, that's where the marshals land. So it was a little airstrip, um, a building, uh, not too many buildings around, just a single building. And uh, plane lands, and here comes the bus, and... Uh, um, the one thing I realized is there was a guy that was shackled. I mean, he had his feet shackled, strapped down. Um, you can tell that, that they had him on, on dangerous person status. Uh, it, come to find out his name was uh, McElhaney. They call him Big Mac. He was a ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood. And he was being sent from Marion, Illinois, which is a lockdown unit at the time, to Leavenworth, where he was going to be put in the shoe and... Um, and uh, await trial. They, they, he, he, in 1995, uh, Mac and some of his bros and some other people uh, caught a case in Leavenworth, and uh, he was on his way back to uh, to represent himself in that trial. So, when I entered the prison, first of all, we came around the backside. So I did not see that that we were across the street from uh, a store. When we came around the backside, it looked like mountains and hills. So in my mind, we were in the middle of nowhere. So we come around the back. They pull up uh, to this wall. It's a 40-foot brick wall, real intimidating. I mean, it's just, it's massive. I think it's actually 35 feet, but it, most people say 40-foot brick wall. The wall was thick enough to drive a little VW bug around uh, easily around the, the perimeter of the prison. And the wall is built all the way up to the main building. So the wall connects the walls circle around and connect to the main building. There was a little door on this wall. It's, it, it leads under under the prison, which is R and D. And we, uh, I think, there was maybe uh, ten of us that get off and we're in our chains and we go through. When the I was right next to Mac, and um, when when Mac walked through, uh, I, I've never seen so many correction officers. Uh, basically do everything but blow this guy. <laughs> they, they were, you can tell that they were afraid of him, or most were. Some of them genuinely were happy to see him. Uh, he spent some time there, so he got to know a lot of staff. 
Uh, they brought him cigarettes, which they weren't supposed to do. They gave him gave him cigarettes. They brought uh, they brought him a big bag of commissary from some of his bros that people that got a care package ready for him and then sent him to the shoe. So this is like this is my first day. I'm walking in and I'm seeing a guy who I know is an AB because he's talking about it on the bus, uh, talking openly about it with the guy who was. Uh, uh, Mexican mafia. I, I don't think he was an Emmy. Something out of Texas. I'm sorry, Arizona. Arizona. And I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, but that guy had a high-ranking position in the in the outfit that he was in, and they were talking openly, and I sat right by them. So walk in. I'm with this high-profile convict, and uh, and I see how the staff is just uh, just lollygagging over this guy just like completely you know catering to his every whim and it was just it, it, it blew my mind and uh so I was kind of tripping off that and uh you know he goes away and then we're we're uh put into side of a little holding tank um I remember there was this guy that was sweating like really really bad he was a he was a biker um I know what outfit he was in because he told me, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. And uh, anyway, so this guy said he had a, got caught with I forgot how many pounds of dope, and he had like two or three years sentence and said he had a good attorney. And uh, so good attorney, a lot of times when guys say I had a good attorney, that's a <laughs> it means that they rolled over. So the good attorney got him to sn a snitch deal. But uh, this guy was just he was scared shitless, and, and he was a big guy, you know. Late 30s, early 40s, long hair, just big, big, big belly, big arms. And, and he, he was going to the camp. And he, he was, like, terrified. And that made me kind of, like, look and say, you know, where, where the hell am I at? But I'm going to tell you, so it smells like an old, musty basement when you walk in. You can feel the history of the place. It was, uh, I think they started in 1899, but they weren't finished till 1910 or 11. Uh, I, should, I should have researched all that before I did this. And I, I need to do that in future videos because I know that the dates, I, I forget. So um, that was, uh, but you can feel, you can feel the history of the place. Now downstairs, when you entered R&D, that had been remodeled. So it was newer, you know, it looked just like, kind of like Oklahoma City as far as the holding tank went. But they, they um, uh, booked me in, you know, counselor came and asked me questions. And the next thing you know, um, they told me to, they gave me like a bedroll and they said, walk up those stairs. Now, what I didn't know was it was about 4.20 when they told me to, to go upstairs. Now, four o'clock is count. That means all stand up count. That means everybody like at 3.55, I forgot when they actually ring the bell. Everybody's got to be in their cells by four o'clock, door secured, stand up on your feet for a, a, um, a head count. So that count usually lasts anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour, depending on if they can get the count straight and then they clear count, everybody comes back out. What I didn't know was that I was entering the prison during the middle of count. And it's rare, if not unheard of, that somebody new is put in a cell during count time because all movements cease during count. So somebody screwed up that sent me upstairs basically. So, I walk into uh, what's what's uh, a unit which is a B lower. So Leavenworth, there's B lower, B upper. There's C one, two, and three. A one, two, and three. I'm sorry. And then there's D cell house. D cell house is locked down. Uh, it was the only unit in Leavenworth that they left as in the in its original state. They they've kept it that way for historical purposes. I think it is to this day. Uh, but that building, it, I mean, that unit was old, uh, bars, uh, heating and air gone, uh, no heating or air, I should say. And they put people there who had problems, check-ins, uh, people seek to sought protective custody, sex offenders, um, uh, gang dropouts, all your less desirables in, in, in the, in the, in the prison, in the prison system or the world of, of prison. So all the bad people, I guess you would say, and that's basically, it's, it's like, it was like the FU unit, you know, um, they treated them really, really bad. And that's five tiers tall. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm getting way ahead.
off track. So I under, I walk in the unit and there was a cop there and this cop had his ear pierced. He had salt and pepper beard. He had these blue eyes that looked a little crazy, kind of long as hair, sloppy looking guy. And uh, he said, hi, I'm happy. You know, introduces himself as happy. And he looked happy, you know, legitimately. And he looked goofy, but you know, he looked like he was happy. And um, we're walking and it's eerily silent. Again, I don't know it's count time. I don't even know, I have no clue. So I'm walking and this cop's talking and he, he realized that I'm from Arkansas. Well, I'm not from Arkansas, but I caught my case out of Arkansas. You can tell by the last three numbers. My last three numbers were zero, one, zero. So he said, I used to, you know, was a guard in the Arkansas Department of Corrections, blah, blah, blah. So he's rambling on. And then he said, do you like knives? <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, huh? You, you know, I, I'm scared. I, you know, I, I am. It's it's weird. The, the whole feel is weird. And then uh, we walk, he turns and we walk through a corridor of, uh, or a vestibule, I guess you'd say. And uh, it's completely black and nobody can see us. And he whips a freaking switchblade out of his pocket and goes, I like knives. I make these knives. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, so a cop, my first day I'm there, we're in a dark spot and this cop whips a knife out of his pocket. And it was, it. He, come to find out the cop's name was Happy. And if somebody that was at Leavenworth or cops or staff or BOP officials ever see this, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody, that that's how he called himself Happy. Staff knew him as Happy, everybody. But he was a prison guard from Arkansas, made knives, and this guy whipped the knife out on me. And I was just like, you know, kind of shit in my pants for a second. I didn't know what the hell was going on. So... Uh, he puts it away and he can kind of see the effect he had on me that made him even happier and, you know, kind of giggle. So brings me up to my cell. I get put in cell 50. That's on the even side. There's even an odd side. Odd, even. I think the, there was, uh, oh, I forgot the number of people this holds. Anyway, the unit held, the unit was huge, bigger than a football field long. Um, Pops the cell door open, opens the door, and up to the door comes this guy who looked like a cartoon villain. He was covered, completely covered in tattoos. He had prison tattoos, and these were all done in prison. He had his tattooed head like this, it was completely covered, and uh, it was it was faded, like the, the tattoo ink uh, that he used was was not was not the best ink, let's put it that way, it's faded out. So, the cop shuts the door and he says, why did they just bring you here? Why did you just come in now? And I'm like, uh, what, what do you mean? He's like, it's count time, nobody comes in during count time. I have no idea, you know, and I'm tripping. Cop just pulled a knife on me, I'm inside 11 worth, I, you know, now I got this guy that looks crazy looking dude standing in front of me and uh, as I put my stuff, I asked him where I can put it, he said top bunk. Obviously, I was going to be on the top bunk. And I look around and I see that this guy is building boom boxes, radios, out of cardboard and little Sony Walkmans. And I look again and I look in his eyes and I can tell he is tweaked out. High as a kite on meth, spun to the hubs. And I look at him and I say, hey, bro, where's it at? And he looks at me and he and he goes, what? What, what I said... I looked around, I said, nice radio project, you know, like letting him know, hey, you know, I, I recognize, you know, I'm trying to get high too. So he goes, shh, and then he goes into the back of the cell and he points to the vent and he, and he says, they are listening, okay. <laughs> you know, so he, he just, and I, to people that never got high, they don't understand, just made me want to get high even more because he was so high. You know, they, people are listening in the vents. You know, come to find out later, cops do walk back and forth in the vents and people do listen, but he made it sound like they were there right now. So I think this guy maybe has, I don't know if he's got ounces in the cell. I don't know what's going on. But um, we talk. I tell him I got a life sentence. Uh, you know, he he's grills me. You know, where are you from? Who do you know? Where's your paperwork? Back in the day, you had to have a copy of your PSI, PS, pre-sentence investigation report that told the tale of everything, everything about you, your family history, personal history, mental health, uh, physical health. If you've told, if you were a snitch, I mean, you know, they, 
Everybody who entered prison had to have one, or you weren't staying in those prison, it, it, on that prison, especially in the USPs. It was like that in a lot of places in the federal system, but 100% for sure, if you didn't have your paperwork, they called it, you couldn't stay. They gave you 30 days, I think it was at the time. Well, I didn't know you were supposed to have your paperwork. Why nobody told me, I don't know. In Oklahoma City, the guy should have told me. But I had it mailed in, so you know, I, I was good. Uh, I, had, I had everything, my priors, you know, I, I, I can pass the test, no problem. So, um, yeah, I can see Yogi, his name was Yogi. He gets a little bit more comfortable and uh, we start talking some more. And um, the next thing you know, counts clear and the doors rack. As soon as the doors rack, I mean, actually, Yogi told me he would be right back. I'm sitting in the chair, Yogi walks out, all of a sudden, here comes a mob. Dio Metzger, he was the guy that lived next door to me, he was a tattoo artist. Alex Salco from Oregon. Gino Klein from Oregon. Brad Hart from California, Charlie Roberts from uh, California slash Texas. He was a military prisoner. And um, last but not least, Will Moore. And I'll get to Will Moore in a second. But everybody wanted to know who I was, what I was from. And everybody had a, why, why did you come in here during count time? You know, I, I guess they thought I was going to be a cop. They threw in a count time. I don't know, you know. So uh, I didn't know. You know, one of my paperwork, me being from California, they want to know if I was affiliated. That means, are you tipped up? That's what they said. That means gang? No. Um, you know, where did I do time? I told them California. Um, Brad was connected to the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, I, I think it's safe to say he was a bit of a California rep or, you know, he was he passed a lot of messages, did a lot of things for the brand. Even though the Aryan Brotherhood, there wasn't any actual members there. There was one who called himself Red. That's a whole different story I won't get into. But there was no real ABs at the time. Uh, but they still had a um, they still had a, a presence in the prison through guys from California, mainly. Uh, they still had tables, so there was poker tables. They still controlled the poker tables and there was none there. And that means that people were collecting money from poker tables and sending the money to the ADX, to Barry Mills or uh, whatever guy that they were sending it to. I don't know that for a fact, but you know the money went where it's supposed to. But the point is, is the Aryan Brotherhood still had card tables and poker tables in Leavenworth when they weren't even there. And again, there was a guy named Red. He claimed to be AB. He might have been patched. He might have even been a real AB at the time, but nobody gave him that kind of respect. Um, and maybe a different episode, I'll go there. So, Brad Harp, he said that, you know, I had to get my home. I was, he was my older homeboy, so kind of, you know, he was the one that was going to grill me and this and that. So, we talked for a few minutes. He burns off. And then in slithers, Will Moore. Will Moore was a guy from... California slash Oregon. He had a big, bulbous, round head, skinny guy with a jaundice glow. <laughs> John had Hep C written all over him. <laughs> he absolutely did. So, uh, you know, he's a hey, wood, uh, gave me the whole rundown and, and, oh, he, I, he said wood and homes a lot. People who say homes, that's a California thing. Um, excuse me. I know some other guys will say different states use it. Originated, originated in California. Hey, Holmes, that's the thing. Wood, I don't know where that originated. I believe California as well, but hey. So if you say Wood or Holmes, usually, you know, you did California time. Sure enough, Will, Will had. So Will's grilling me. I wonder if I get high and how much money I had and this other, you know, I can say this one was slippery when wet for sure. Well, my celly comes back a few minutes later. Will's standing right there and he says, hey, I got a couple papers. So I said, okay. He said, they're $50 a piece. And I said, all right. He goes, you're going to get me one? You're going to get one for me? And I just look and I go, yeah, you know, sure. I had $500 in my account at the time. I had family that was sending me money. I had some assets still. So, you know, but long story short, yo, he went and copped the dope for me, got himself one and said, hey, you're going you're gonna to get me this one too. You know, I was 27. I just turned 20. I know I was 28, just turned 28. But anyway, so yeah, you know, I'm the young guy and I'm definitely, you know, a lot younger than the rest of them there. Uh, mid thirties on up, 
But, you know, it's kind of a soft press, <laughs> but it had to happen. But yeah, I wanted to get high. So anyway, uh, Will steps in, Yogi steps in and said, all right, I got dope. He says, now you're going to have to get this guy commissary. No problem. You got, you're going to get it. You're going to get it tomorrow or the next day, a couple days. Yeah, no problem. He goes, he wants all sodas. Now, buying $100 worth of dope. But guys, I don't even think, I don't even think twice. He wants sodas. No problem. I just want to get high. Well, he gives me the drugs. We open it up and it's heroin. It's not speed. It's not meth. I thought it was meth. It wasn't. And I, I kind of stopped for a second and I'm like, uh, uh, you know, it's black tar. Um, now I have done heroin, never on the streets. I did it in Chino for a bit before I left and I wasn't an intravenous drug user. I had tried it at Chino. Uh, when I got out, I never did heroin. I've never used drugs intravenously, but there I am. Got a paper of dope and Will with the John Disclo pulls out the outfit. Now the outfit is a big pin. Wow, I got one right here. Literally this broken in half. So just break this in half. They get a point from a, a real syringe. They then melt the point in here. So they take all the guts out. So it's an empty barrel. They slide it, then they melt it. So there's just a point. And then they get, they call it a banky. And that was from um, from industrial milk bags. They got big industrial milk bags. They've got like a little, I guess it'd be like a tit, you'd call it, on the end of it. They, it's, it's rubber. They snip it and they put it right here. Also, some guys use Visine bottles. It's just something that'll suck the, 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 the water out of the spoon and then you can shoot it back into your arm. Well, they had a good homemade outfit. And uh, Yogi had bleach. And I said, I can't. I don't shoot up because he ain't got bleach. Yogi had raw bleach. Well, fix the raw bleach. And I'll tell you the truth. I was a little nervous. But uh, um, I was all in at that point. Plus, I got these two guys here. Uh, you know, whatever. You can say what you want. Scared. Uh, um, intimidated. Uh, peer pressured. It wasn't so much. But it was just, you know, I had him go get the drugs. Will's here. I've just got her. Okay, you know, I'm not a pussy. Fuck it, I'll go. I mean, that's basically how it came down. And don't get me wrong. I wanted to get high too. And you know what? I did like heroin when I when I did it in Chino. As a matter of fact, I had planned to get out and go do some heroin. But it just never, it never happened. Thank God. Maybe I would overdose. Whatever. So, um, I, I don't believe I was in that cell. It was about 15 minutes because it was five o'clock. I think the doors racked at 445. He had a little clock on this thing by five o'clock. So I was inside of prison, inside of Leavenworth, 15 minutes before I did my first shot of heroin. 15 minutes. That's all it took. And, uh, and I did it. And, uh, and, uh, to be honest, uh, it, I felt great. I, I don't want to put that out there. Uh, I'm not trying to tell uh, people, especially younger people, to do it. I'm not trying to. Uh, I, I would strongly urge anybody not to try it or do it. That's the truth. One of the reasons it takes away your happy um, when you do heroin. Uh, it's sad to say, but nothing else compares. Everything else in life is second best. And, and that's just being honest. And that's think of your best memory you can have. And that's only would only be the second best memory because uh, the best feeling there is is heroin, and it's and that's that's the tragedy of it all. It takes away your happy. It really does. You feel good, but it ultimately takes away your happy. Anyway, because I was high, I was able to leave the cell and, and socialize freely. Uh, you know, had that warm feeling and that red face glow, probably whatever I had going on, and uh, ran around the prison and met a bunch of guys and. Uh, um, that's how I spent my first day. And uh, that was my first adventure in Leavenworth. Nothing else um, noteworthy or uh, happened that day. But um, yeah, and I'll tell you what, I didn't stop. I didn't stop doing drugs, uh, especially in Leavenworth. I was there five years. And uh, even when I went to the shoe, which I spent most of my time in the shoe, special housing unit, locked down the whole, um, I, I got high in the shoe too. So Leavenworth was, I, I hear from some people still, is, it was a nonstop party. I mean, rock and roll party. Yes, it was dangerous. Yes, there was violence. But I mean, it was, it was like being on a roller coaster with your hands up, screaming, yeah, 
out the whole time, the only thing that was missing were the girls. All the booze you wanted, all the dope you wanted, good times as long as you had money to or good hustle. And it was just rocking and rolling. And it, and uh, the longer I stayed, you know, after the first year or so, it took me a year before I started going to the hole. And I went to the hole because of a dirty urine, because of heroin. And uh, but once I started going, I started I started really getting into the whole prison thing. That's the politics, gang stuff. Um, and I just I embraced it. I, I just embraced it. I always thought I was going to get out. Um, well, I did in the beginning, and there was a point about two or three years in when I lost my second appeal. It's called the 2255 that I did not believe I was going to get out. And that's when I was just like, you know, I'm going to be the biggest, baddest, not baddest, but I was going to be, you know, I, I was, I was striving, I think, to go to ADX, which is the control unit in Marion, which is the worst of the worst go there. And guys who go to uh, Marion was also locked down, or especially ADX, you know, they're, they're kind of treated as, as royalty in the prison system when they get out. So I, I saw how guys were treated and, uh, you know, and I love to be locked. I do lockdown time really good. I write, I got a routine going. Um, the routine included wine and, and like I said, there's drugs there. So I, I liked, I, I, I had no problem being locked down. So anyway, that was my first day at Leavenworth. Uh, there'll be plenty more stories to come. I think tomorrow I'm not gonna do a, um, a anything about my time in prison, meaning I'm not gonna continue the, like the diary of or, or my journey through. I think I'm gonna branch off and I think I'm gonna talk about synthetic drugs in the, in the federal prison system. I think I'm gonna go that route tomorrow. If not, it's coming soon. Otherwise, uh, I hope, I know this is kind of long, 31, 32 minutes. Some people are telling me to cut it short. Some people don't care. Some people are telling me to stop using people's names. Um, I, you know, let's uh, make that decision as it comes. Um, so I'll we'll figure it out. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy. And once I get to a thousand subscribers, I'm going to do this live. I want to do this live every day. I would like to do it for a half hour to an hour, whatever, you know, just have a regular talk show. We'll see how it goes. So if you can, please subscribe. Please tell your friends to subscribe. Um, throw me some comments, private message me, Robert Russell on Facebook, put public comments out, whatever you want to do. And again, convictinc.net. You know, anybody in prison who needs assistance in any kind of way, administrative remedies, by the way, that was my thing. I I'm really good at administrative remedies. I'm really good at DHO appeals. I'm really good at getting guys back good time. It's really hard and I got good at it for whatever reason it happened. So you guys need have people in, in the joint who need assistance. Get a hold of me. Info convict inc at gmail.com. My phone number is also on the website. You can call me. Take care. Have a good day. Bye.